was able to come back for the VIP here, uh, Mark Grossman. For those of you who don't know, Mark um, was really one of the, probably the first person who introduced me into the world of EMS uh, way back when, many years ago, uh, when he was the medical director at uh, for Miami Dade. Uh, and he was, you know, kind of an on the ground, uh, boots on the ground kind of guy, as we all know. And unfortunately, we lost him to the Northeast, where he's now up in New Hampshire doing incredible things in EMS as well. Uh, obviously, when he was in Miami, he was uh, part of the Eagles group. So I'm sure Paul's going to be happy to see you here, Mark, today. But uh, Mark called me up one day and he's like, you wouldn't believe what just happened to me. And um, as soon as I heard the story, I, I said, you know, is it possible that I can tell people about it? He says, wait till I publish the case report. <laughs> so what you're going to hear today is, is uh, it's incredible, but uh, kudos to Mark for actually publishing it. Uh, Mark, do you have the PowerPoint or do you want me to pop it up? Can, can you pop it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me, let me do that and we'll do some housekeeping stuff as well, just to make sure that, um, let me see here, setup show, individual window, okay. Uh, some housekeeping stuff, just so we can get everyone credit for today, is the following. There it is. So hopefully you can see my screen. Today is CME is 15289, and later will be 15290. As, as I've mentioned in the past, I'm going to start rebrand. You know, we had a meeting, our Florida chapter of NMSP, and we're going to start to rebrand this specific webinar under the Florida NMSP brand and then work alongside uh, Angus and FAE MSMD, so we can kind of uh, parallel each other and complement each other. But um, as I mentioned, today's presenter, as you can see, is Mark Grossman. Um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind telling us uh, where where you work out of, a little bit of your history, and then uh, get started. We really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, sure. So I am a uh, a rehabilitated Florida transplant. Um, I grew up in New York, and um, after I was sort of involved with the recovery effort from September 11th with a group called Disaster Psychiatry Outreach. But I, I started out as an EMT, and I, I was always been involved. I've always been involved with EMS in my medical career. Um, and when I was in Jersey City, I was working at Mount Sinai, in Jersey City. I was the Jersey City EMS medical director. Um, and then had an opportunity with Kathy Schrank. She recruited me in 2004 to come down to Miami. Um, and I was in Miami from 2004 and uh, sort of in a few different places in Florida, but I was in Florida till 2016 or 17. And because of family reasons, actually my son was a figure skater we moved back up to the Northeast. He was recruited by US figure skating and I got involved with New Hampshire. And um, so I'm the EMS medical director for uh, various towns up here. Uh, so I'm in Portsmouth, I'm the ER director of Portsmouth, EMS medical director, and also for a town called Derry, New Hampshire, which encompasses like a, a few other towns. Um, so I've still been involved with EMS, just not at the same level as Miami Dade. I mean, Miami Dade was a full time job. That was I don't think there are many jobs like that in the in the state of Florida, uh, let alone in in the field of uh, EMS medical direction. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's a little background on me. Um, and uh, I don't know. You want to talk about the case, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um. So this case was uh, a, a, a nearly a tragedy, but it was a um, uh, two older teenagers that were driving uh, on one of our main highways. And I was at my community hospital, not at the trauma center. Um, and uh, uh, so she actually, she was in the car. She was a passenger that wasn't restrained. And the uh, they hit the guardrail and actually flipped the car over. And when EMS got there and the police, um, th this isn't the uh, uh, this isn't the car because it was it was yeah, a this, different this, road. But this is just me googling something. Right. So <laughs> those those are in fact cars that have crashed. So <laughs> Peter's right. So um, basically, uh, the, the the car rolls over. Police get there. EMS gets there, and they say she 
had this classic syndrome where she was had loss of consciousness and then woke up and the police get there when she wakes up and she's 17 and she lied and said that she was 19. Uh, and just then the boyfriend's father arrives and they said, well, you, you know, this big bump on your forehead, uh, you should probably go to the hospital. And EMS is so different from uh, in New Hampshire, so different from Florida that I literally had somebody having a stroke drive to the hospital, complete right sided paralysis. And he drives his car to the hospital. And I said, sir, why would you put people's lives at risk driving to the hospital when you knew you were having a stroke? He walked in and he said, I think I'm having a stroke. And he says to me, well, I didn't want to pay the copay of the ambulance. It was $250. Like people here are well insured, but they're very cheap, <laughs> right? So I said, well, I don't understand. How did you do it? Like you have complete right side of paralysis. He's like, I just kept making left-handed turns. And I looked at him and I said, of course, of course you have an answer, right? So the motto of the state is live free or die. And, uh, you know, they, we, we, uh, we go through this every day, as opposed to Miami where people call 911 because they lost their prescription. Um, so very, very different systems up here. Anyway, so she doesn't come by ambulance. I, I thought, I, I guess she figured she was gonna get in trouble. So she walks in with the boyfriend and the father and uh, two o'clock in the morning, middle of February, it's snowing out and very dramatically collapses onto the floor uh, in triage and starts vomiting. And now she's unresponsive. So we get her on a stretcher, we bring her back. I call for a trauma alert, which, you know, in a community hospital doesn't really do anything because we're we're already there. It's just the the, the emergency uh, department that's really showing up to that. But to help facilitate getting the CAT scan prioritized. So I get the CAT scan, and I just, you know, I put in for a trauma series, and I was in the middle of doing something else. So I get her to CAT scan. I get her ready to probably be intubated because she doesn't look good, and the the tech calls me, and she's like, "I'm not sure you want me to do the rest of the CAT scan." you know, the best of the pan scan because the, the CAT scan, is that the video, Peter? Can you uh, play the? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the video. Yeah, they play it real quick, yeah. Okay. Um, so the CT tech is, you know, calling me out of the room saying, uh, can you come look at this? Because I don't think she needs the rest of the scan. Um, so everybody sees that it's a, obviously large scalp hematoma, but there's an epidural hematoma. Uh, as well, and something needs to be done immediately. I mean, this is something that doesn't come up very often. I've been practicing emergency medicine for a while. I graduated from residency in 2000, and I, I did this once with the neurosurgeon when I was a resident, and I, I hadn't done it since. And I've worked in trauma centers, but I, I don't know. Um, it, it just hasn't come up. And uh, so I tell the secretary, can you call for a helicopter? And the helicopters weren't flying because it was snowing out. I mean, this is something that doesn't come up often in Florida, I guess, if there's a hurricane, but um, the helicopter pilots are pretty aggressive in Miami, at least. So the next call I make is there's like a back channel uh, line for the Boston Children's ER, because I figure, well, she has to go to Children's and that's really our only children's resource hospital. I mean, there's Mass General, but children's is children's. So I call up the ER children's. It's an ER doc I don't know. And I explain what's going on. She's like, hang on, let me loop in the neurosurgeon. Again, it's like 2, 2.30 in the morning. I don't know any of these people. And I call the neurosurgeon and I just, I'm describing what's going on with the patient. And I said, I think I know I need, I know what to do. I think I know what I need to do I just haven't done it. Like, I, I don't know how to do it, right? And I don't feel like watching YouTube videos. So he says, uh, well, why don't you start with mannitol and hypertonic saline, just get her evacuated. And I said, well, it's no helicopter. By the time I get an ambulance, I, you know, we're having the same problems up here that I would imagine you're having where interfacility transports are taking a lot of, a long time because everybody's so short staffed. And this is still, the beginning of true uh, last uh, oh, that 
and that is an ambulance for reference. Um, thank you, Peter. So I um, I call the neurosurgeon and you know he's telling me just treat it medically and get her out. And I said, it's not gonna work. She's already unresponsive. She already has a blown pupil. She's already vomiting. She's already bradycardic. She's already hypertensive. Like all, the, she's got all the things right? All the things that you worry about, like she is actively dying. So I FaceTime with him. I said, can I just show you what the CAT scan looks like? So I FaceTime with him and this was kind of a novel thing. I mean, you know, hopefully nobody here is going to wrap me out the hip to the HIPAA people. But um, so I'm FaceTiming with him, the CAT scan, and his quote to me was, oh, shit. And he said, what are you going to do? And I sh said, I have, he's like, do you have a trepanating drill or whatever it's called for the skull? And I said, no. And I wouldn't want to use it if I had it. He said, the only thing that I have readily available that I know what I'm doing with at least is an easy IO. And he says, what's an easy IO? So I show him and he says, Okay, that looks okay, but do you have anything that's a larger bore, like a larger gauge because it's, you know, to evacuate the blood? And I said, no, it doesn't work that way. It's length based. I have pink, blue, and yellow. And I sh opened them and I showed him. And he's like, well, the blue looks right. Okay, that's a very strong endorsement. So with that, I show him the patient, I show him the scan. <laughs> He starts doing calculations in his head that emergency docs don't do, including using pi. He's like, okay, so if I divide this, any what he's doing was figuring out the volume and uh, like how much I'm actually going to be able to get out. So he figures that out for me, and I I already had her intubated. I'm she's head of the bed's elevated. I'm hyperventilating her, and I explain this to the to the doc. He's explaining to me what to do. And I go to the mother now and I said, look it, if I don't do anything, it's probably a very high likelihood she's gonna die. She's not even accepted anywhere. And I still have to get an ambulance. And the closest trauma center is 30 minutes away. Once the ambulance gets here, the pediatric hospital is an hour away, 45 minutes away. I said, so if I don't do anything, good chance she'll die. If I do do something, Good chance that she'll die, but it's also an equal chance that she'll live. I, you know, I'm, I'm just making it up. I mean, I don't know how people do this, but you know, it's like let's say it's 50 50. Um, it's this isn't something that I normally do, but I'm you know, on with an expert who does this often and he's going to help me. And she said, Obviously, please do it. And she gives me a hug. I'm like, okay, we're in the room, like next to the girl. So I kick, I kick her out because I don't want to hear, I don't want her to see me crying. And um, I'm FaceTiming with the guy, the neurosurgeon. He tells me where to go. And it was, you see that it's frontal. So it's not over uh, the middle meningeal artery where you normally imagine this. So it's a slightly different location. He, we sort of do like a, you know, a FaceTime stereo tactic. And he's like, okay, I take my pen and I mark where I'm going to drill. And then I put the phone down on the table and I start drilling. And I'm, I'm, the nurse is standing there staring at me like, what the hell is going on here? Like, she's not helping at all. And, um, and I drill and I take the, the, the needle and I start drilling until I lose resistance, which is a very, you know, scary moment because I don't know if I'm losing resistance in blood or brain or whatever. And then nothing's coming out. So I, I, you know, I take out the little trocar and I put on a syringe. And I guess I just sort of had to break the seal of the, uh, the first clot. And I start pulling out with a 10 cc syringe. I start pulling out blood. And I think I initially pulled out five uh, syringes full of, of blood. And uh, then I put the syringe back and it's sort of coming out slowly. So I just leave the syringe. And the guy is on FaceTime on my phone on the table saying, what's going on? What's going on? So I pick up the phone and I show him and she begins to wake up. So her pupil goes down. She's moving. Now she has to be sedated and we get a second CAT scan. And what Peter has up right now is 
one picture of the EZIO in her skull on the post evacuation CAT scan. And then you see there's blood all over the place. I mean, it wasn't just this epidural, but um, you know, there's components of subarachnoid and stuff like that, and there's skull fracture. Peter, do you have the next slide, the next picture? Yep. Nope. Nope. Maybe you don't have a the one with the easy IO. Nope. The other one. Is that all you got? Show show the one from the slot from the article. Maybe you don't have it. Uh, yeah, okay. Mark, hold on. I, I have it a second. Can you see that? Hi, Kathy. No. Yes. Are you showing the right one? Hi, yep. Mark. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah. So that that's the, that's the picture. So it was in the right spot. I'm evacuating blood. And what's scary is that even though I pulled it like 50 cc's, seems like a lot of blood to be in the skull. And what's interesting is even as I'm pulling out blood, it's reaccumulating. Mm. Uh, so you see that there's still a fair volume of blood. I mean, you can see that little demarcation line. Um, so anyway, AMR gets there and they're like futzing around and I'm like, look guys, you know, this isn't the time to make sure you got everything right. She has to get to the trauma center. Just take her, you know? So they put her in the truck. Mom gives me another hug. I put her in the ambulance and they go. And then I somehow, you know, it's an hour, hour and a half later. And, you know, of course I have patients waiting to be seen and, you know, I have to sort of like try and figure out for my own mental health, how do I deal with this? I have no idea if this little 17 year old girl is gonna live or die, right? I mean, she's already essentially dead, but I go about my day and I don't know anything because it's not at my hospital, I have access to that hospital and she's just sort of off. And uh, somehow the, the PA from the neurosurgery uh, team at the other trauma center uh, he texts me I, and I go home I, after my shift and I'm like an emotional wreck. Like I'm, I'm crying, I'm shaking. It was very, very anxiety provoking, very scary, yeah. very intimidating. And, you know, at the time it was like, yeah, very easy to make the decision. Like I know what I have to do and you just motor through it and it's adrenaline and you do it. And then as you begin to think about it and ruminate and you're not sure what's going on, you're like, should I not have done it? You know, did I make a mistake? Did I, should I just try to get her out quickly? And like, if she dies, you know, I, am I responsible for it or whatever? It was just very emotional. And then the guy texts me like at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm not sleeping, it's an overnight shift. And he, he sends me the after, he starts sending me after pictures. He's like, oh, she's fine. She's in the OR, you know, for like an hour. We drained out all the blood. We fixed the, we fixed the fracture. And she's awake. She's extubated. I'm like, huh? That's amazing. What? Are you sure? <laughs> and so Peter was showing the after picture. She came back like a month later and visited with us. And um, that's her. That's her scar. She's, you know, I, that's actually like a, a, a legitimate hairstyle in some places. Um, <laughs> so, and she is fine. I mean, she has migraine headaches and she has some that's the that day that's that morning that's wow. the picture he sent me like nine o'clock in the morning and then later in the afternoon the mom's texting me showing me her walking around with like physical therapy I'm like okay wow. I, I guess uh i guess i'll go back to work tonight and hope <laughs> this doesn't happen again so uh and this is her when she came back the oh so it was cool was if it, the picture that's on the right, where I'm fa we're FaceTiming with the two doctors, the neurosurgeon and the ER doctor from uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And obviously that's me with her and her two parents and then the three nurses I was working with that night. So it's a very nice reunion. I, I still talk to her and to her family. Um, obviously they're, they're grateful and I, her, the mother's brother is actually like a ER doc in Ontario or something like that. And he explained to her, he's like, what happened with my niece 
is nothing short of a miracle. Uh, like, so I think they have a, a real appreciation for what transpired that night and how important it is that she's okay. Um, and then when we looked it up in terms of EZIO itself, uh, obviously it's not approved by Teleflex or EZIO or anything like that. It hasn't been FDA approved as a procedure. And um, uh, there was, I think, one or two other cases that were unsuccessful where the person died. Um, so it's nice. I, what's really nice about this, and one of the reasons I want to publish it is not every ER has somebody trained in how to do a, a burr hole or trepanation or whatever you want to call it. Most every ER has people that are experienced with EZIO. And I was curious uh, how many people would be willing to reach for this or think about reaching for it and then actually use it in anger if you if you needed to, who would be prepared to do it. And I think it should be part of a, a training, like this is a MacGyvering method. It's a temporizing method, but it, it's something that, again, somebody who's an extremist, is this something that we can use to temporize things until we can get them off to more definitive care? Because a lot more of us work in hospitals like I was at for this, then work in level one trauma centers, level two trauma centers, academic centers. Um, we all work all over the place. And, you know, people in Florida, it gets real rural real quick. Uh, so in New Hampshire is the same thing. I mean, you have Southern New Hampshire and then you have Northern New Hampshire where you can go for hours and not be close to a hospital. And then you get to one and it's one of these 25 bed <coughs> critical access hospitals. So it's not even that helpful. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know who, who else would reach for this or would have thought of it, but, um, I just like talking about it and seeing who else would consider this and who would consider it even more now. Um, and I do uh, think that EZIO should have this as some sort of training and say it's an off label indication, but listen, you, you guys have it, you know how to use it. You're comfortable with it. I use EZIO all the time uh, for obviously the indicated reasons, but. So Mark, um, you know, first of all, I think I could speak for all of us that um, this is a life that you saved. And I'm not so sure how many people would have had the, the thought process, the wherewithal to actually think through that and do that. Um, and obviously it's never been reported before, at least only maybe a few times. But my question for you is, have you approached anyone, let's say ATLS, um, or, you know, kind of someone in that realm to, to perhaps look at this as, as, as an alternative option? I mean, is that the right thing to do? I'm not sure, Paul, maybe you have some comments on, on that, because I think this is, you know, something that everyone should know about, which is one of the big reasons right. I want you to come on and tell the story. So, uh. Paul, what are your thoughts? You, you've been in that. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, uh, well, no, I, I approached I approached Teleflex, and they haven't really responded to it. I, I was surprised. I would have thought they would have jumped all over it, but I may have been talking to the wrong people. Probably, yeah. So, hey, Mark. So, first of all, this is like I, we don't have enough time for me to gush out about how cool this was that you did this. Uh, we're here to support you. If anything ever came out of it, obviously, it's not going to be a negative thing because. Right. Uh, of the outcome right and uh, i think it was really clever and it was great and i think it should be possibly an indication if it comes down to it and the reason why is that there are some people that work in austere conditions as well mm -hmm. and if it gets down to it and you see somebody who's coning out like that because she had all the classic <coughs> cushing cushing signs right and um it would be worth something worth a try just like we do a finger thoracostomy in a desperate situation right. so i think there are some potential so a couple of things, I'll have to um, do this offline with you, so make sure you communicate with me. Um, but there are people in the neurosurgical community and people in the uh, austere community, uh, such as uh, the military, that I, I will plug you in with, because this was very, okay. very cool. All right, I have one question. Um, the uh, So you were taking blood out, got 50 cc's out. It was clear that there was ongoing bleeding. So there's a couple of things I, I would even think about or anticipate if you were getting it on, but I'd have to do it, you'd have to do it real early as something like considering in the future two grams of TXA, just a thought to throw that mm. in that situation because these guys can continue to bleed. 
of the question is, did they find a source for it? Uh, it was, was it the meningeal artery or just did, was it hit in a place where it ripped a lot of different things and it went all over the place? I, what, I, I, I think, think it was just a, a I'll, I'll have to circle back with the neurosurgeon, but yes. my understanding was that it was a, just like a, dur a bad dural tear. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. That's what it sounds like to me. And that's what I was getting at. And that makes a different challenge too. But also in, uh, in the reason why is because if you're over the temporal area, then, you know, the bone, it's, it's very thinner bone and it's a little, you know, right. or easy to crack. But then, so I don't know, it's, there's a lot more to get into this whole discussion, but, uh, but uh, this is fantastic. It's fantastic to see you. By the way, where do you live? Whereabouts are you living? I'm living in Exeter, New Hampshire. Yeah, I know Exeter well, and then uh, and you're working out of for the most part in uh, in in uh, you know Portsmouth, so that's fantastic. I'll have to come yeah. have lunch at the library sometime. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Anytime. All right, um, I got to go to my other meeting, but um, this is fun. this is just a great presentation. I actually want you to present it to the Eagles sometime, Mark. And uh, of course. You could even stay on and do it now. I just have to have it a tighter presentation, but uh, uh, Peter can help you get on later on, I think, into that, or we'll switch over to that. Okay. So, uh, all thanks, right. Thank you. I'll Peter. give him the link. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Paul. Paul. Uh, yeah, one more thank time. Thank you, Paul. Mind, oh, ahead, Paul yeah. What Peter told you before, the CME for today is 15289 for this session. And, um, and then also, is there anybody else that wanted to pipe in? Kim, as usual, you always, I think you always have something great to say too, Kim. So go ahead. Okay. Hey, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, Kim Landry. I'm wondering if, we, if you couldn't expand this uh, to perhaps uh, uh, incorporate ultrasound and use this for, uh, say, for example, cardiac tamponade. Uh, maybe, maybe use it in an I.O. for evacuation of a cardiac tamponade uh, if you had it under uh, ultrasound guidance. Uh, your thoughts on that? I mean, that sounds, it sounds interesting. I, I'd be... I'd be afraid to if the heart's beating just because of how rigid it is. But I, you know, I do the same thing with a spinal needle now. So I guess it's not that that much of a far of an extension. Yeah, but that's a great idea for the brain if you have that available. I, I think. Hey, one thing I just wanted to see uh, because of your presentation. Uh, did you? I don't know if you saw what my name was for today, Peter. Did you see that? Yeah, see more blood. <laughs> that was good. I finally nice. got it this week. I finally got it this week. Honor of Mark. Um, Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I did want to mention, what yeah. I did want to mention real quick is that um, you know Dave Miramontes had published a paper on the use of the femoral IO in adults for distal femur. Yeah. And that's not an FDA indication. It turns out, in order for Stratelliflex to get these things FDA indicated, they have to reopen the application. Is my understanding. Mm. It's the same reason that they still have the EZIO labeled three to thirty-nine kilos, which makes no sense whatsoever. Right. right. So, so they they will inherently not expand on on their offering because it makes them have to go back okay. to the FDA. So, right. It's unlikely that that would happen. It's it's a can of worms. So, it's a can of worms. Yeah. So, Peter. Yeah, Wayne. Go ahead. Hey, uh, hi, Mark. Uh, Mark, uh, hi. you know, you get a you get a Buckeye or whatever on your helmet. That's an amazing story. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Things. One, I, I when I came out of uh, the Air Force down here and I'd seen a lot of trauma, I had a very, very similar case and uh, I didn't have a clue. And um, uh, I didn't and IOs had not been invented yet. So uh, and she died right in front of me. A neurosurgeon did come in, but it was a very terrible case and that's uh, i think that's what also happened to liam neeson's wife if you remember that but yeah. what i want to ask you you said early on that you had some um you had an episode in your training or somewhere that you quote tried this with a neurosurgeon but you didn't try it with an io with a neurosurgeon at that no point. no you no yeah it was, just, it was okay, a regular yeah. burr hole drill okay okay right. so you had you had seen a burr hole done by the neurosurgeon but uh, yeah. so okay I'll tell you five this, some odd years ago. I tell you, uh, you open up the doors. This is great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Um, and your, the other thing I was going to say was that uh, we we definitely have to progress out, and I think we can get past some of the FDA stuff by getting to the right people, especially the T T triple C people and so on. I think yeah. uh, there's a lot of that'd be great. So let's. I'll get you plugged in with them because we're working on some other Thank stuff. Thank you. Uh, so I got to go. Right. Thank you all. Yep. For, this was Thanks, great. Paul. Great. That's my everybody too as well. All right. See you later.
Thanks, Paul. Uh, Mark, I'll, I'll send you an email so you can come on to, to Paul's show and you can present it there. But uh, any, any other comments before we uh, before we move off? Um, I see um, I see Yoram from Hatsala. Uh, Yoram, you want to make a quick intro and say hello to everybody before we move to Paul's? Uh, Hi, everybody. Webinar? I had to especially show my face to my old friend, Mark. Mark has a great presentation. Really enjoyed that. Thanks, Yoram. Or to give you a hug in person for that one. I appreciate <laughs> it. One day, well, next year in Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all we all learned something, you know, pretty special, and I think we'd all feel pretty confident doing it because we all have so much experience with the EZIO. So, I just agree. another thing to have in the toolbox. You know what I'm saying? It's I agree, important. and 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 I think it's a great idea to have it rolled out to ATLS so that you know people at least have it in their mind that this is a possibility that it's been done before. And if push comes to shove, just do it, you know. Hundred percent, hundred percent. All right, awesome. Well, you know, maybe, uh, Mark... uh, maybe, uh, uh, Chris, uh, Peter. Go ahead. In terms of expanding, maybe EZIO ought to think of a uh, re-engineered device for this purposes. Yeah. As far as stabilizing the needle, Wayne, is that what you're talking about, or, no, or what? Uh, maybe a, a, a slightly larger diameter, perhaps a lo little longer, if you're going to start like a doing larger bore drill. Yeah, right. You know. Anyway. Interesting. Good stuff. All right. Well, um, you know who also you should tell about this, uh, Mark. I can put you in touch with Scotty Bolliter, who does all of the all of the um, uh, cadaver labs out of Texas in, near mm -hmm. San Antonio area. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to connect you with him so that you guys can discuss. He he'll, he'll send you an email like three. Pick. He's so intense about what he does and he loves. And he was the one who got EZIO to the market with all the studies. So um, cool. I'll I'll connect you. Uh, Mark, I sent you an email so you can log on to the other side. And Angus is going to switch us over. This will be posted on our YouTube channel, by the way, so you know. We, we, we now put all of these webinars on the Florida NAMSP YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Find us on Twitter. We're trying to become social. If you haven't joined, um, you can always email me and learn how to join NAMSP, uh, not just for medical directors. This is for EMS leadership as well, and the conference is in Tampa. Mark, you're going to be there, NMSP, in Tampa, January? Uh, maybe. Yeah, if it's in Tampa, maybe I'll go. Yeah, bring your pirate outfit, Gasparilla. is apparently oh, 300,000. 300,000 pirate people are going to be joining. So I'm sure Angus is going to have his, his outfit uh, ready. So, all right. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll see you guys on the other side. Thanks, everyone.